And verse 19, Therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to Him in doing good as to a faithful Creator. So what we're going to talk about today is this. Um, what are you doing to stay committed to His second coming? Again, what are you doing personally to stay committed to Christ's second coming? In other words, the church today should be showing the people that, God's, that, that, that Jesus is returning soon, right? How we are acting should be telling the world that our God is coming soon. So what is our reaction right now to the times that's taking place? Number one, should you be astonished by what's going on? Absolutely not. If you know your word, Jesus in Matthew 24, which we will begin to look at the events here soon, uh, maybe next week, I don't know. But anyway, we're going to be looking at the events that's taking place. Jesus already is preparing us for what's to come. He's already prepared us for what already has taken place, right? So the question is, what, are our re what is our reaction from this? We as a church body should be excited right now. We should not be distressed. We not, should not be distraught. We should be excited. We should be going out to the highways and byways going, guess what? He is coming soon. You know what that means? There's not going to be any more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more crying, because our God is coming back soon. Are you ready for it? That should be your message today. Not going, oh man, did you hear about China? And then now North Korea? I mean, and then now all of a sudden, the, the 20th is coming up, it's approaching. What are we going to do? That sound like a, a church that is believing their God is coming soon? Does that sound like a church that believes who their God is? Absolutely not. So we got to understand, what is your reaction to all these, these end-of-time events? What does God say that we sh how we should be acting? So I'm going to show you part of a, a scripture. If, remember, I told you every single one of us need to drop our own thoughts, our own uh, wisdom out the door for what we have learned in the past. We're going to all learn this together. Amen. We're not going to have our opinions and interpretation mixed in. It's only what the Word of God says. So if you know this scripture, don't, don't blur it out. Don't run for everyone else. But I'm going to put a scripture up here. It's only part of it, and I want to see what it says. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, the writer of this book in this particular verse is telling us something. And what he's saying is, do. We're talking about doing, right? And he's saying, whatever it is he's telling us we're going to do, we're going to see here at the end of this message. But he's saying, whatever it is te he's telling us to do, he says, so much the more. In other words, in Greek, it means in greater detail. In greater, i got to run down. Um, in a greater degree, more often. What, what he is telling us to do He's saying, I want you to do it in a greater degree, and I want you to do this more often. Why? As you see the day approaching. Well, what day is he talking about? Christ's return. And we're going to concrete that at the end of this to confirm this is exactly the day. And we're going to, during this end time discussion, we're going to look at the specific, the day. But, but just hold on, we're going to look at that later on. But today I want you to understand, and again his word will tell us, that the day approaching is speaking about Christ's return. And what the writer is telling us is what he is telling us to do, we need to do and do more so. We need to do it at a greater detail. We need to do it at a greater degree. And we need to do it more often. So whatever he is telling us to do, what do we need to do? Do it more. Do it often. Do it more than you have before is what it's saying. Amen. That's what it's saying. And I, again, I'm not just adding something. This is exactly what the scripture is saying, and we need to understand what it says. So, with that, we're going to get to that eventually. But right now, go to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to get in the meat of this discussion. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to allow the Lord to begin to do some, uh, some work in us. This part right here is going to go extremely deep. And like I said, we're going to see a lot of verses. If you're taking notes, I would suggest just to write down the, the verse and the information that comes from it instead of trying to get, get in your Bible to it. It's just going to be just too much. So try to make it as easy as I can for us. So go to Hebrews chapter 10 and look at verse 19. 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now, let's just stop there for a moment. And uh, let me show you uh, my, my take on this for a moment. Yesterday, I spent the whole entire day, from morning to about 4 o'clock, I guess, yesterday afternoon, on that one scripture. I cannot get past this one scripture. And it's okay, if you're studying God's word, and you get stuck on one scripture, stay on it. Don't, don't move off of it. And I'll tell you why I was stuck on this one particular scripture. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And this is why I was stuck on it. The holiest, of course, in the tabernacle and in the temple, represented what? Yeah, it, right past the veil, right? Which was God's presence. The Ark of the Covenant, it was one little cubicle. And it, it had the Ark of the Covenant, which we'll talk about in a minute. But it represented God's presence. So the high priest was the only one allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, the holiest place, and be in God's presence, right? So this is where I got confused yesterday. He's telling us to have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, right? God's presence is what we're talking about. Where is God's presence at right now? Inside of us, right? I never thought about this before until yesterday, and he just stopped me yesterday. God's presence is inside of us. So what does that mean, having boldness to enter the holiest? Yes, individually, the, the Holy Spirit's inside of us. But what does it mean to enter, to enter the holiest if the holiest is already inside of us? What are we talking about here? And, and this is where we're going to really start getting really deep with this. So first and foremost, this holiest in Greek actually also means sanctuary. Not only does it mean a consecrated place, a holy place, but also means sanctuary. So when you say, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus. You see, the sanctuary represents the altar of the church where we cry out to God. The place where we come together, not individually, but corporately. You know, does, it, does the word of God say that God inhabits the praises of one person? The praises of his people. It's very important we understand this because we're going to see this really deep in a moment. But God inhabits the praises of his people Israel, which, of course, part of us is that, but not to go too deep. But again, having boldness to enter the sanctuary. So inside the Ark of the Covenant was three items. One was the golden pot that contained the manna. The other part was the Ten Commandments, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And the third was Aaron's rod that budded, right? So what is this talking about? What this represents, first and foremost, is the, the golden pot of manna represents the bread. And who is the bread from heaven? Jesus Christ, right? So what it's first saying is we need to have boldness to enter into the sanctuary to proclaim the bread from heaven, which is Jesus Christ. Third, the second part is with this, the tablets, which represent the commandments, the word of God, the law. We need to come boldly into the sanctuary to proclaim God's word, God's commandments, to speak what is sin, to speak what we are truly called to do and supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. And finally, the budded rod of Aaron, which represents, uh, number one, it, it showed that the Aaron was chosen of the priesthood. So we know that 1 Peter 2.9 says that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Second of all, it was a miracle that it, it budded. Not only did it bud, but it actually produced almonds, right? So the reason why I'm bringing all this forth is this. When we boldly enter into the sanctuary, number one, we should be proclaiming the name of Jesus. We should be proclaiming his word and his word only and what sin is. And third of all, though, proclaim that we are the chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, but not only that, that there should be miracles performing amongst us. Is that taking place today in the church as a whole? Think about it. How often is the name of Jesus Christ being proclaimed? In other words, how many churches today are saying, you know, there's other ways to get to heaven other than through Jesus Christ? Do you realize that Christian churches are proclaiming that today? Do you understand that there's Christian churches that are actually compromising themselves with sin? Saying that homosexuality is okay now? 
allowing that to come in. That adultery, well, you know, it's just, it's one of the sins, but, you know, it's, it's covered, we're covered under grace now, right? And, and miracles, there are certain Christian churches that no longer believe in the working of miracles today. And here he said, now we should have boldness, guys. Do we have boldness coming to church? Oh, we're going to, re- you might as well take your shoes off. Say it. Say it, brother. Come on. Come on. They are. They're worldly. Because a Christian church abides by the word of God. Very true. So let me ask you this. When you come to this house together to corporately worship God on a Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, is there a boldness inside of you? In other words, a boldness saying, I don't care what's being spoken out here. I don't care the circumstances that's going on out here. I'm coming to the house of God to worship my God. That is boldness. What's the opposite of boldness? It's timidity. In other words, going, well, you know, I don't know if I should go or not. Cowardness. That's good. Fear. It comes down to fear, doesn't it? What are you fearful of? Yeah. What are you fearful of, right? So the question is, when we come to this house, are we coming in boldness? Going, I don't care what is being spoken of out here. I don't care what's being spoken of in here. I don't care if you're throwing me under the bus. Guess what? I'm not coming here for you. I'm coming here to glorify my God with you. And if you are speaking against me, I will pray for you because I don't want that to be on you. I want to pray for you that God will, will open your eyes to let you know, don't be gossiping and slandering and back biting everyone else this should be a sanctuary a holy place a place of refuge a place of safety amongst one another out of here this is the place where it's covered by the blood of jesus during the plague come on now during the plagues that's taking place during this worldly time right now this is a place we can come in and, and feel secure have bonus to enter and i don't care what they're telling us out there it doesn't matter because does it line up with the word of God? If he's telling us, is there anywhere, we're going to see right now, is there anywhere he says, I want you to go to my holy sanctuary, however, if this occurs, well, you don't have to. Is there anywhere in the word of God that says that? Make sure that we're on the same page here. Is there any buts at all? No. No. Remember, we said, if you butt heads with God, you're a goat. You're not a sheep. Goats are the ones that butt heads. If he tells you to do something, you go, but that makes you a a goat and not a sheep. So we got to have bonus. Guys, where's this bonus at? Where's the bonus to come in and go, you know what? Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. That, you know what? Sin is sin. And sin leads to what? Death. Does Does sin lead to grace? No, it leads to death. And is there miracles amongst us? I guarantee there's, if I sat here and count all of y'all today, that's how many miracles I see in front of me today. Of all the miracles that took place last week, week four, week four, and coming up this week, you cannot tell me that there's not a God who works miracles amongst us. So where is your boldness and your faith at? And praise God, it's here because I see you all here. I'm actually preaching to the choir, I guess you could say, because you're all here. But i got to vent a little bit at the same time because there's some that are not here. That's missing out on the goodness of God. And the, oh, yeah, this is biblical. (laughs) Make sure it's not my, my flesh here. Look, when you're not in the house of God and when you're not around others that's encouraging you, guess what happens? We talked about yesterday. When you, when you leave the house of God for a while, you become offended at the least little thing. I wonder what they're, they're, they're saying about me today. You will be offended so easily when you leave the, the house of God, when you leave fellowship. And what will happen is you will leave the good news to watch the worldly news. You will, wa- you will leave the good news to watch the fake news. And you'll be glued on that because as human beings, we've got to be glued on something. So it's either you're glued on God or you're glued on the world. So let's, let's go really deep. I've got to turn here. You don't have to. But we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, if you're writing it down. And this is what we're going to talk about right here. God's going to destroy individuality. And it says this. 
And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, I could take all morning to explain to you the, the Greek, um, I don't know how to say it, uh, verbiage, if you will, the grammar of the Greek, but I'm not going to do that. I was going to just jump right to and what how this word of God reads. All right. This is exactly how Paul would have spoke to the Corinthians. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you all, you notice, number one, what agreement has the temple? How many temples is listed right here? One. This is a singular noun. Temple of God with idols. For you are the, what? Temple. One temple, not many temples, one temple. We're going we're gonna to have to relearn something today that's been taught that is an error. And it's great that we need to know this for the end times. All right? And what agreement has the temple, one temple of God with idols for you? Mostly everywhere you look in the New Testament, when you see the word you, it's actually plural. So down here in the south, the way that Paul would tell the Corinthians is this. Uh, for ye all are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So we got to understand, he's talking about a group of people, y'all, as one temple. All right? You understand that? Okay. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And this is what this says. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Now, listen. Or do you, again, this is how it would be spoken of by Paul and here down south. Or do you all not know that your all's body, one body, is what the temple, not temples, the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom y'all, who is in y'all, by the way, whom y'all have from God, and y'all are not your all's own. All of that is plural. Everywhere you see you is y'all. So let me read that again. Or do y'all not know that your all's body, one body, is the temple, one temple, of the Holy Spirit who is in y'all? Whom y'all have from God, and y'all are not y'all's own. We are all one, right? This is what Paul is trying to say. There is no individuality mentioned here. The temple is made up of many members of us. And we'll see this in just a little bit again here soon. But what, God, what Paul is doing here is this. He's preaching to the church. The church who is what? Together. Not, a, not individuals. In, in other words, if the individual stayed home and said, I don't need to go to church to listen to God, guess what? They would have not heard this message. And sometimes I really want to just cut off the, the video some days, to be honest with you. Because you know technology has caused Christians to become lazy today? This is going to offend a lot of people, and I don't care. This is God's word. So much technology has caused laziness in Christians to where there is no boldness to come to the church house anymore. None at all. Why should we come to church? I can, I can glorify God on my own. Can you? Is that what the Word of God says? Exactly. Do we want to see Jesus return? Yeah. So if you want to see Jesus return, you want to see it quickly, guess what? Follow the Word of God. Because things have to happen. What we learned about last week. Before Jesus returns, what has to happen? The gospel has to be preached all over. Are you preaching the word even in this little community? You see, we want Jesus to return, but we just want to do this. I'll wait right here, God. I'm going to wait right here for you, Lord. When he's like, you should be spreading the gospel. And you should be meeting amongst the brethren. One more. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Again. Do y'all not know that y'all are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in y'all? And he goes on, I don't think I have, yeah. He goes on and says, If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. Singular. Not, he's not going to destroy the whole temple. He's going to destroy the one that's acting up. For the temple of God is holy, which temple y'all are. 
is, is Paul at all speaking to individuals? He's speaking to the church as a whole. You've got to understand, he's speaking to the church as a whole. No individuals involved. The church as a whole. He's seeing the whole entire temple as a whole. Um, go to, uh, we're going to look at 1 Peter 2, 5. Again, I'm going fast, but I've got a lot to show you. Uh, you can see it up here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, And guess what you is? Y'all. Y'all also, as living stones are being built up a spiritual houses? House. House is singular. Uh, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, again, singular, to offer up spiritual sacrifices except for God through Jesus Christ. I love this scripture right here because it kind of gives us a, um, a visual. Each stone that is placed in the house of God is us. Individually, we make up the what? The house of God. If there is a stone missing over here, is that going to bring strength to the church house? It'll actually create a hole. Do you understand when you are missing, it creates a hole in us? Do you understand if this wall right here was just Maybe because a normal wall is 16, uh, 16 inch on center. Studs. The studs are 16 inch on center. If this was every six foot on, on center, how weak would that wall be? Be very weak, right? But imagine, now don't think about the electrical and all that, but imagine this whole wall was absolutely full of studs. How, how solid would that wall be? It'd be almost impenetrable, would it not? So now look at the church today, all over. How many spaces, how many holes are within the church? Do you understand why we need each other, guys? When you are missing, there's truly something missing from us. And uh, Ephesians 4.4. 4. Again, i got to see what I wrote down in my word here. There is one body. Wait a minute, how many bodies? One body. And one spirit just says you were called in one hope of your calling. So again, we see that there is one body, right? How many bodies? One. There is one body, and that's the body of Christ that we all make up. Again, when, when you're reading this now, you understand Paul is not talking to us individually. Paul is talking to the church as a whole. And it's so important we need to hear that, and the reason why is this. How many people is missing this? How many people is missing the good news of Jesus Christ being preached? Because they're not amongst a church that is, is preaching the good news, but they're, they're sitting in a living room listening fake news. And what is happening to their spirit? Cause them to become timid, fearful, corrupt, do you see how it diseases the body of Christ? And Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 19. Now therefore you, y'all, are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And members of the household of God. Now wait a minute, household, that's, that's singular, right? Actually, this is plural. Household. Think of your own household. When we're talking about our household, we're talking about the relatives that lives in our house, right? The thing is, is this household in, in Greek actually means relatives. It's not about the family of God. You see, when we come together, we should no longer be strangers. We should no longer be foreigners in each other's lives. But, but we should be fellow uh, members and saints of God's family, we look at the church as the church, right? As a church, ah, you know, nothing special. Uh, no, this is the family of God. We're brothers and sisters amongst the family of God. You may have spiritual fathers or spiritual mothers or something like that, but yet we are still the members of God's family in here. This is how, how Paul is talking to the Ephesian church. He's like, look, don't just look at it as, as a um, country club. This is God's family coming together to worship God because of who he is, not just what he does. It goes on, having been built 
on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. You're going to hear this foundation at the end of this. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone is where the whole house starts. Without the cornerstone, there is no house. It will fall every time. The, the, the cornerstone is the chief vision of that whole entire house. Everything is built upon that cornerstone. 21. In whom the whole building, being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Again, these are singular. Singular nouns. In whom the whole building... And again, we're talking spiritual building. We're not talking about this building. The spiritual building being fitted together grows together into a holy temple in the Lord. Again, no individuality. We're talking about a group effort here. You understand that? We are all part of this, and we'll see this at the end, that your role plays a huge role. Your position plays a huge role, not only in the church, but in the end times. And it finishes up with 22. In whom y'all are also are being built together for a dwelling place of God and the Spirit. And again, we're talking about the church here. The church corporately as a whole. So with that being said, I don't have to go to church to worship God. Is that anywhere in, the, in your word of God? Have you come across that anywhere? Okay, has we need to come together to worship our creator, worship our God, to, to extol one another, I guess is the word, to, to uplift one another, to encourage one another, to be there for one another, to strengthen one another. Is that in the word of God? Okay, so we see God's will versus people's will then, right? If you say that you don't need to come to church to worship God, that is your will and your word and not God's will and God's word. For us to come together is God's will and his word. Do we understand that? Have we established that God has just destroyed individuality? He has just destroyed the mentality and the mindset that I don't need to come to church to worship you, God. Because it's not found in the word of God, guys. This is not my interpretation. Show me in the Word of God where it says you can stay home and, and worship Him. That you can be out of, of the way of the church to, to be alone with Him. Show me where that's at. You won't. Now think about it. If God Himself, being Jesus Christ, let the throne room of heaven to abide with humanity, He could have worshiped the Father on His own. He went by Himself to pray, because sometimes we've got to get away from each other, do we not? Sometimes, yeah, see, you hear that? My own wife says, sometimes i got to get away from you. But did she come home? You better believe it. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> but that's the thing, though. Yes, it's good to get away from each other for a, a specific amount of time to pray, hear, hear God's voice and all that. But, but lifestyle-wise, we need to come together. Oh, just maybe every now and then, right? Look at verse... Uh, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. I want to show you now what our role is as a church, especially in these end times. Why, the question becomes this. Why do we even need church, right? Why, do we e why does God need the church? We always say God doesn't need anything. I understand that. But why is it God's will for his people to come together as the church, especially in these end times? Well, let's look. Ephesians 3.10. It says this, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. That word manifold wisdom means many or various, the manifold wisdom of God. So what this is saying is this, It is up to the church to reveal the many various types of wisdom of God to who? To the principalities and the powers in heavenly places. Now, go back to, you don't have to turn there, but Ephesians 6. Um, do we wrestle against what? Flesh and blood? We, we, principalities and powers in the heavenly places is what we battle against. So let me, let me, okay. So we can watch the news and go, this person, that person, that person is a devil. This person is evil, this is of hell, and all this and that, right? <laughs> Are we wrestling against those people? 
Does God love those people? What should we be doing? Pray for them, right? Instead of getting angry, what's your reaction when you watch the news? If it's getting angry, turn it off. Pick up the good news. Because that's what the enemy is trying to get you to do. But look, the church is supposed to make known the wisdom of God. So what this means is this. People, if, if we're to make the, the wisdom of God known to principalities and powers in heavenly places, how much more are we supposed to make it known to the lost? When people ask, what are we going to do now? Well, I, don't, I don't know. Is that wisdom of God? Is that godly wisdom? No. No. The first thing you should say is, once you come to church and hear what we're supposed to do. Come amongst the brothers and sisters. Says, You're freaking out. You're acting like the rest of them. Come to church. Get encouraged. Know what your place and your role is in these end times. Being the church. So again, known by the church. The church is to make known the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God is found all over his word. When you ask God what to do, it can come either by the Logos word, the written word, or it can become by the Rima word, which is the spoken word of God. Words of wisdom. We ever, ever talk about words of wisdom in here? Yes. It is a what? A gift of God. He will give you wisdom in your situation. We actually should not be not knowing. The only thing we should not know is a day and hour. That's it. We should know the seasons. We'll talk about it later on. So, what's the next one? Look at Ephesians 3.20. Not to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Is there any power working in us today? You better believe it. It should be. You should be a walking transformer of God's power. No matter if it's your situation or, or another person's situation. A again, I said this before. Remember, you are not a, a thermometer. You do not change with the atmosphere. You are a thermostat. You change the atmosphere. That's how much power and authority you have. When you go into the hospital, you don't go, oh my gosh, I don't know what we're going to do. I, I'm, I'm coming in agreement with this doctor. I mean, he said this. You don't care what the doctor said. You speak God's word. By, by, your, by his stripes, you are healed. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Do not come in agreement with what the doctor said. You've got to be careful with that. Where is the power inside of you right now? Ephesians 5. Oh, no. Uh-oh. Oh, well, we can't be having that. See? That old devil don't want us to see this. There it is. Again, go back to verse 21. I'm sorry. Uh, Ephesians 3, 21. It says... To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him be the what? Where? In the church. Church here, by the way, is singular form. The house of God in the church amongst God's people should be what? Glory. To him be glory in the church. Is the church glorifying God today? The church is spreading what kind of news today? And it's not the good news. I hate to say it, but truth is truth, guys. We have to see the truth as, that, as truth. To him be glory in the church. Inside the church should be glory. What does that look like? Um, Ephesians 5, 27, real quick. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, meaning honorable not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That's how God sees his people. When his people comes together, it is a glorious thing in his sight. It is an honorable, oh, come on. It is an honorable thing for God's people to come together. So why do you think there is such a, an attack of God's people coming together? Are they attacking us? They're attacking God's word. The reason why there's such an attack of people, of God's people come together, the reason why, why government wants churches to shut down is because it's God's word that we come together. It, it's God's word. Look, anything God has brought together, man should not what? Exactly. That's talking the church and that's talking marriage. Again, if you read 527, he's talking about how much a man should love his wife. 
as Jesus loved the church, no matter how bad times get, the enemy wants us to be separated because it knows the power amongst us. That's the only reason why your marriage is getting battled and the church is getting battled. When the enemy knows when you come together you are a powerhouse, why do you think the attack comes? Again, with the church, if the government wants the church shut down, because the government knows what the truth of the Word of God is, and it does not want to be spoken. Speak the truth. Uh, this is what it looks like. Hebrews 1, 3. Who being the brightness of His glory, and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down in the right hand of the majesty on high. This is Jesus Christ. The church is to be Christ-like. In other words, we call ourselves Christians, right? We are to be Christ-like. Christ was what? The brightness of his glory. The brightness of God's glory, right? So how does that represent the church today? Matthew 5, 14. You are the what? The light of the world. We are to represent God's glory here on earth. Are we being glorious? Are we being honorable people? When you are outside of God's people... When you consider yourself part of God's people, but you don't want to interact with God's people, can I tell you, you're not being a glorious person. You're not being honorable to God's word. It's God's word that says we need to come together. You're a light of the word, a city. When, you drive, when I drive home at night, the city of Crestview lights up the sky. If I was lost and I was looking for a city that hopefully had a gas station, I would follow that light. That's how we are to be in the darkness. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. If you're inside God's house, guess what? There should be light illuminating in your life. Not only by the word of God spoken, but from one another. I can shine my light in your life and show you maybe areas that, that you are missing in your life. You can do the same thing in my life if I'm like, I don't know what to do. Your, wisdom, your godly wisdom can shine light in my darkness and reveal what I'm supposed to do. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What is the church's role today is to do what? Glorify. To be Christ-like and glorify God's glory in the midst of the situations that's going on. This is what the Lord said, and I'll finish it up uh, here in just a moment. God designed the church so that His glory can be revealed through His people. That's a whole reason why God designed the church, so that He could reveal His glory through the people. I could preach on that all over, but we're going to go back to Hebrews chapter 20, and I'm going to finish it up. This is very, very quick, and these are the do's that we were talking about before. <clears throat> So therefore, I'm going to read 19 again, and we'll go right into 20. Hebrews 10, 19 says this, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and have a, having a high priest over the house of God, house of God, the high priest is over our house, amen. And it says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This blew me away. Number one, it's actually possibly uh, Luke that is writing this book, but we're not getting into that today. Again, he's saying, let us. And notice, this is what we are called to do as people of God in the end times as a church. We need to draw near with a true heart, being one heart and one mind, in full assurance of faith. Do you have full assurance that everything is going great right now? You should. You should not be freaking out. Our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. That word bodies actually is singular. Key JV's got it wrong. The modern King James got it wrong. The new King James, whatever. Bodies should be singular. And our body washed with pure water. When you come together, we are glorified in God's sight. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promises faithful. You go back and read these things and do a heart check. But this is another thing we are to do is what? Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. Are you wavering in these end times? Are you strong today, but then tomorrow you turn on the news, you're like, oh. That is 
unwavering, or I'm sorry, that is wavering, and unstable in all your ways. 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. We should consider one another. And when you say, hey, how are you doing? It's not just a greeting, it's how are you doing? Let me, let me know, how are you doing? I, I consider you a, a family. I consider you a friend. I consider you part of God's family. We're brothers and sisters here. And right, I want to know, I want to know. And then finally, guys, we're here. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Is there any but right here? No but. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Assembling actually is singular. It's a, a group effort coming together to assemble as one, ourselves together, as is the manner of some. The, Luke is like, there's some of you that's not gathering together. That's not word of God. But exhorting one another. That word exhort actually means to invite, to call, to comfort, and to urge strongly. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Say that one more time, Carl. The closer his return gets, the more we should get together. In excitement, thank you. With excitement. Showing them, look, get excited. Because Jesus is about to return. All this is going to fall to the wayside. Who cares about what's going on? When we stand before Jesus Christ himself and the glory, all this stuff's not going to matter, guys. But he's saying, do and do more off in greater degree. I want you to get together and even more so when you see the day approaching. And that's where we're going to get into next time is what are we looking for as the day approaches? Don't we think that the day is almost here, right? And to confirm, this is what we're talking about. Therefore, do not, this is 1035. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Listen. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just, that's singular again, the church, the just, the righteous shall live by faith. But if any one, any one person, singular, draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, to destruction, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. This is my last right here. <clears throat> God gave me a vision yesterday to kind of solidify everything. <clears throat> this is a construction site. And as you see, um, well, more than likely it's a house, right? The house is being built. And we talked about before, all those walls represent something. You see, before this could even be built, a foundation had to be poured. And it was a foundation that was poured a long time ago. You see, in order for the house not to sink or fall, it's got to be built upon a foundation, what we will call the rock. And when the, the foundation is the rock, the, the house will withstand any type of storms. And then you see the walls that, that's taken place. The walls represent the structure of the building. It takes shape and it, it, it provides structure to the house. And then... Um, you, you have people come in, like the roofers. The roofers will come in, and they'll, they'll provide a protection over the house. Come on, you're, you're going to hear what God's going with this. The roofers add protection over the house. And then you'll have guys come in, the electricians will come in, and they'll stall power to the house. You'll have plumbers come in, and they're going to stall pipes to allow running water to come into the house. You're going to have the um, uh, dry wallers come in, uh, and they're going to uh, sheet the inside of the walls while the framers sheet the outside of the walls. The, the walls present structure, but the dry wall and the, um, the OSB board or the um, CDX, it will protect, protect, it will bring strength to the house. Where if it, it, it can't be twisted, come on now. It can't be shaken, it can't be twisted, it, it brings strength. And then you'll have um, your uh, air conditioning guys. They come and bring comfort. And then you'll have the painters come in, and, and they, they, they bring the beautification of the house. You see, at this point, God's design 
has been given to man. I'm getting ahead of myself. The, the, the owner of this, this house has given man the blueprint design of how he wants it. And everything you see in this picture right here is part of the house. I want you to understand that everything you see right here laying on the ground, that lumber, is still part of the original design of that house. And it's supposed to be included in the building of this house. And each lump, piece of lumber has its own agenda for the house. Ah, oh, the house is complete. It's glorious. It is finished. The owner of the house now can abide in the house forever. Each part has played its role in the building of that house. In this picture, everything you see is still part of the progress of this house. It's still part of the original blueprint design for that house. But he, what's in the front yard right there? There's lumber, right? There's a stack of lumber right here. <laughs> right. You see this right here? You see that same stack of lumber? That was part of the original blueprint design of the house. There is that same lumber that was not used in the house. Now, let me ask you something. In this picture, it still has the opportunity of being used to be part of the, the house, right? When the house is complete, is that stack of lumber part of that house? And it never will be. Guess what will happen to that stack of lumber? It'll be thrown away. It'll be wasted. You see, there's people right now, guys, saying, and this is a vision God gave me yesterday, that stack of lumber represents Christians who say, I am part of the house. These are the Christians that say, I'm part of the church. Because I associate myself with part of the church. But is that stack of lumber part of the church in this picture? It's not here. It's not in the, the actual building itself. It's not incorporated. That's good. It's not incorporated. It's associating itself with the, the house, but is it part of the, the building process of the house? So when the house is complete, what happens to that? Those represent the Christians who have associated themselves with the house of God, but yet never took part in the building process of the house of God. And when the building is complete, and the owner gets a certificate of occupancy saying, now it's yours, guess what? That wood is going to be left to the wayside and it will be destroyed. Yes. Do you understand how important it is to be part of the church body and how God has come against individuality? That represents individuality. They never were. Look, it's the same, same stack of lumber. It never was part of the church. It might have been carried through the church every now and then, but it was never part of the original blueprint design. It, was never, it never took place in the building process. It just associated itself with the building. So now when the building is complete, it will be left behind. I want to ask you today, where do you find yourself? Are you going to be part of the, the original blueprint design? Or are you going to be part of the process of building this glorious looking house or are you going to be part of the lumber that is out there in the sunlight getting beat on weathered and forsaken because of your own decisions it's going to rot it's going to be rotten because it's out in the in the elements right it's not being protected by the house itself thanks brother do you see how important it is for us to come together now especially in these end times. So in my closing is this. Where do you find yourself in that house today? Are you inside that house being part of the building process? Or are you outside individually just doing your own thing?